Helen, Helen Safar, S-A-F-A-R. And I was born in 1920, October 18. When the First World War ended, then uh, Stalin gave, um, uh, gave uh, Romania, no, this part of, of Hungary was given to Romania, which was called uh, uh, Transylvania. Uh, Transylvania turned Romanian in 1918, and I was born two years later. So I was born uh, during the Romanian era until 1940. So I was 20 years old when the Hungarians took over again, when Hitler gave it back to, to Hungary. We became Hungarians. However, our mother tongue was all along Hungarian. It started out that in the downtown area, big posters were, were of uh, ugly Jew, Jews and ugly stories underneath the picture. Uh, lies, you know, all kinds of whatever bad you can think of uh, was, was told that that's the Jew. And uh, unfortunately, the population took on very easily. And, and uh, very, very shortly, it was... Uh, uh, visible that that they they are hate the Jews being hated and uh, they cooperated and when the time came for instance we were very we had to wear the yellow star of David then uh, if you uh, happen to go out without it which nobody dared then right away somebody went and and said it and uh, dragged them away uh, then when they put us into the ghettos, uh, the population went to look in the forests and bring Jews for, forward from places that they were hiding. They, they dug them out like a cat after the, the mouse they were going after, and, and so they cooperated. It, it, was, it was no... And, and when, when they took us, uh, we had to walk to the ghetto, and then from the ghetto, you couldn't see a friend. And we were actually uh, happy that they didn't come, because those who came, they were shouting and spitting at us. So it, it was very unpleasant, and then when it was over, when the war was over, I would have s said I'll never go there again, but still, my father, before we left for the ghetto, he said, children, you were all born in this house. This is our home. I have been through a war before, and the war might throw us apart. I want you to know that no matter where freedom fi finds you, you don't remain there. You come home, this is your home. This is where we meet again. And it was like a goodbye, yeah. you know, this is where we meet again. And when we arrived to Auschwitz, the separation, that was such a, such a horrible feeling. You know, we, we always were hoping that we'll stay together. And uh, when, when we were separated, my parents were being pushed away, and Ethel's little boy was in her mother's mother-in-law's arm at the moment. And uh, Mangala was showing us to go this way, but they were going that way, and they were being pushed. And I looked back when we had to run this way. See, those who were strong and healthy were chosen to live for forced labor, and the others were designated for the gas chambers. And uh, uh, when I looked back as we had to run, and I saw my mother's expression on her face, seeing us being separated, just the two of us she saw being separated from Because the older children, they were all on their own already. They lived in their own uh, different uh, towns, and they had their own children. So it was just uh, the two boys and myself left uh, by uh, those last years in, in, in the home. And when she saw the, an Ethel with her little boy, her husband was in forced labor camp and didn't know about him. So we all were together. She was with us, of course, and the baby. 
And when she saw the baby is being slept away, she was running that way. And then the soldier came with the dog. Each uh, an SS soldier had beautiful, big uh, 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 German shepherd dogs. And uh, when I saw that, she was trying to run to her little boy because he was crying with his arms outstretched. And she wanted to get her little boy. Then the German was coming with the dog. So I, w I ran that way also and grabbed her back. And that's what saved her life. Up on the cattle car, there were uh, these young men uh, in, in line, prisoner young men, about six or eight of them, in front of each one of the cattle cars when they opened up. And their job was to jump up and vacate the cattle car. And these young men, each with their own languages, you know, we, we didn't have the same language in the Hungarian, especially, especially was standing alone. They were going around and, and uh, very quietly so that down below the Germans wouldn't uh, uh, hear them. They were not supposed to talk to us. Quietly, young women give your children to older people. We had no idea why they say that, but they knew that this way they can save lives. We were not uh, taken out of Auschwitz uh, from May. We arrived 24th of May, 1944, and we were not taken till October out of Auschwitz. They took us to Schlesia. And there we were working, uh, they called it Panzergraben, very hard uh, work with the earth, and it was frozen, it was terrible, terribly cold, and the, the usual uh, horrors we have gone through. And uh, in January 1945, when actually Auschwitz, uh, uh, my hometown was liberated already by the Russians in September 44. But this was happening in 45 already. So in January, they took us from Silesia to the death march. And that was even worse than anything else because they didn't leave anything, anyone alive behind. Those who couldn't walk, those who wore out their shoes, they had frozen feet, they had infection, they couldn't walk, they were shot on the end of the line. So uh, that happened and it started in January and all the way till the war ended. However, I had my sister-in-law, my sister Miriam with her daughter and they were even, uh, for them it was even harder. The, the walk and, and the hunger and the cold and the misery. So we helped them escape. And Ethel and I decided we still feel strong enough after uh, we had helped my sister and her daughter escape, we will go as long as we can. And then we escaped since we have no dates, you know, we didn't have paper, pencil, uh, calendar, stuff like that. Uh, I think that it must have been some time in April when finally Ethel and I escaped. It was really very hard and very hard to believe that we'll make it. But we just figured rather than being shot on the end of the line, we'll just take a chance. And it, it happened. Uh, how we escaped? The way it was, we were always elsewhere every night, and they wanted to have a rest of their own. They wanted to have food. They wanted to take care of themselves to go on with us and uh, be, be able to keep us together and we don't run ar around uh, out of the line. So every night they had to put us up somewhere so they can go and, and have their life. They did have a, a wagon coming along at all times where they had their teepees, their blankets, uh, mattresses, stuff, that if we fell between villages uh, and towns too far, where to spend or how to spend the night, they were able to just take, uh, set themselves up. Some of them were sitting and, and uh, they were rotating through the night 
some were resting, some were watching us, but we were all ordered to lie flat on the snow. So this happened several times, many times, that, and it was terrible during the winter, especially that winter I read somewhere that it was a stronger winter than, than usual, the, between 44 and 45. So uh, what we, we did what we could. We did have blankets. Each one of us got one of those horse blankets. They didn't give you any warm if they got wet. They were so he heavy. But still, it was something you could cover yourself with. We always carried that with us. So what we did, we uh, put down a blanket, and then as many of us, we could like herrings, you know, like lie next to each other like this. If one turned, we all had to turn. And that was the nights that we spent when this happened. Many in the morning didn't wake up. Then we just throwed them off the blanket and off we went. We just left them there. They never, during the death march, we never had the funerals or, or the burials, I should say. So Ethel and I, we decided that whenever the opportunity gives itself, we'll do it. So when we, it was a terrible night, it was blizzard, it was cold, and, and it was just, it seemed like, like big balls came from heaven. So we had to lie down and we situ situated ourselves on the edge. We didn't tell anybody about it. And of course, when we were ordered, everybody lie flat because if you lift your head, you'll be shot. Uh, in no time, we, everybody was asleep, quiet, so we started on our stomachs to, to move in the, in the dark. And, and we moved, uh, then we felt that we're kind of falling because it was, the hill was a little round. So we felt like we were falling. We turned around quickly and we fell on our feet into a little ravine. And it was very scary because there were big rocks in it and it made a noise. We, we kind of plumped into it and we stopped for a moment and waited whether they didn't hear up there the, the Germans and they didn't come after us. And after a few moments, we started putting the foot before the other and slowly out of the ravine and we started running. Far away in the dark it looked like there is a house, but it was not a house, it was a tool shed. The people, there were lots of uh, uh, in Schlesia, uh, uh, around Schlesia and Zay, there were lots of uh, 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 forests. And the people who worked in the forests had their uh, equipment in this house locked up. So we felt around in the dark and my sister lifted the window without glass, it just opened up and we went inside. We spent our time there. Our back, uh, on the back, our coats had two big letters, like a foot high and white oil paint, KL which meant, you know, if you run away, they know who you are. Anyway, the way we looked, they could tell because they saw marches, the, the population could see because marches were going soldiers, you know, uh, prisoners. It was, we were no news, but anyway, this is how they let us off from the camp. So what shall we do? We tried to get it out, we couldn't. Then we decided, uh, we cut a blanket a, a tree, uh, like a, in a triangle, and we went out. Where shall we go? Our hair was cut again in March, and, and we had no hair, and the fashion was long hair, and we knew that they recognized us right away from that. Besides that, we were so emaciated, we, we were just skin and bone. But how can you make yourself invisible? That was the, the figure out, what shall we do now? We had, we had some idea what was happening in the world because as we were going towards that, uh, that uh, from the house, 
that little blank, uh, 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 no, that little uh, shack. As we were going toward the village on the highway, we saw from far away a couple were coming towards us. We recognized them that they are the, uh, the Saxons. We called them in Hungary the Saxons. They were the onion and garlic growers. They uh, claimed that they had been, uh, they, they were Germans, they were still speaking German, their language. They wore their own uniform, they were like, like a sect. So we recognized this, the, this couple and we figured maybe they, we can communicate with them. We communicated fine, they were speaking Hungarian with each other, so we started asking them questions about this, where the war stands, uh, where have they been, where are they going. So from them we, we knew they said they come from Breslau, they're going to Czechoslovakia, there is a school where the Hungarian refugees are. They keep them there, they have food and, and lodging and everything, so they are going there. Do we want to go with them? So how can we tell them we cannot cross the border? We can't go from Germany to Czechoslovakia without any papers. So we said, no, no, what's the name of this little village? They told us the name. Yeah, I said, that's where we have some relatives waiting for us. We cannot go with you. But it was wonderful that we had finally something to go on where we want to go. We want to be Hungarian refugees, Nazi refugees. So uh, that was our biggest luck in this whole situation. So we uh, went back and forth between this little shack and the, and the village. And the one time, we, the first time we went out, it was very early in the morning. The peasants had given food to the chickens. We stole their food. It was uh, mashed potatoes with raw uh, uh, cornmeal, no salt, no nothing. But it tasted wonderful for us because for days we had nothing, absolutely nothing, just snow and snow and snow. So we stole the chicken food. We went back. And then at night, that same night, we went into the village and we looked out where we can go where there's no man. We were afraid to meet men because they would be, uh, they would be questioning too many questions and they, they might just turn us in again. So we saw an old woman and the daughter and they let us in, we said we are. So we told them the story, we come from Breslau, we were bombed out because there's very many uh, oil fields there. So the allies were bombing Breslau very much. So uh, we said, can we come in to warm up? So this couple, we, after all the lies we told them about what we learned from this couple, uh, we saw how, how uh, they treated us, how they, they cried when they saw us uh, taking our clothes off. We told them we, they made us a bed. We said we can't lie there because we're full of lies. We're going to fill you up with lies. So we, we're just going to sit through the night. Thank you very much. They said, no, no. So take your clothes off. They brought in a pot of, of water and, and they cooked our clothes, they kept us there for a couple of days till our clothes dried and finally they said, don't worry, when we told them that we have to end up in Czechoslovakia, how, how can we do that? They said, don't worry, the old lady said, my daughter knows a way where she can take you across the border without being caught. And this couple saved our lives, we came to Czechoslovakia she took us across during the night and we found the school and with no questions they gave us a piece of paper here, fill it out. So naturally we spoke the language perfectly and we filled out the, per the, the papers perfectly and they said, okay, go upstairs, so that corner is yours. And that's where we stayed for around 10 days or so and we were liberated by the Americans and that was our luck that we were able to come to the United States. 
but uh, there were many things were happening before that because we went home and we found we are prisoners again because the Russian had occupied our uh, hometown and uh, uh, we couldn't leave. You couldn't leave uh, to go anywhere. We knew that we will have the right to come to the United States, but we had to escape. So we escaped during, the, during another winter night. We knew that uh, when uh, Roosevelt died and uh, 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 President Truman became president, uh, he declared that, uh, that uh, the remnants, some of the remnants of uh, this uh, uh, Holocaust uh, will want to come to the United States. So many each year will be allowed to up to a to that many number. I don't know the numbers, that's why I'm not saying it. So many uh, uh, refugees will be able to come to the United States if they can provide uh, sponsors. Now, I knew, since my father lived in America before the First World War, he came here with his brother-in-law, with his sister's husband. I knew that we knew Ethel and I that we have an uncle here in America. And we, but uh, we didn't know addresses or, or even first name. We knew for uh, one the first name. So all we knew was that their name was Friedlander. So we gave uh, the, the name of Friedlander, but they couldn't find the, for the, I mean, who knows? In a big America, I couldn't even, we couldn't even say whether it, uh, we, they always uh, talked about Brooklyn. I knew that my parent, my father lived in Brooklyn. And uh, they couldn't find them. However, uh, my sister-in-law had a cousin who lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and she was able to arrange with the Jewish community to uh, sponsor us, and they brought us to Milwaukee. So we, we lived in Milwaukee less than a year, and then we came to California because she had an aunt here who lived here, she, who came in the 20s to live in California. So she said, don't buy anything, don't settle down because you'll come here, so we did. At first, when we first came, we worked, um, uh, my sister-in-law, Lindsay, worked for Bank of America. Uh, since the, we didn't have the language, you know, we weren't so, uh, uh, so uh, easy uh, to be employed. So at uh, first in Milwaukee we were working, I was uh, working in a, in a tannery. It was very, very cold and very stinky there. And uh, I was the only white girl working. At lunchtime, we all sat together. I was the only white. Everybody else was uh, African American. Mm -hmm. So it was not a very desirable place to, to work. It was hard and stinky and, and cold. So I'm repeating myself. <laughs> but uh, we didn't stay very long. So uh, when we came here, then I went to work at Moore's Cafeteria. I was picking the dishes from the table because I couldn't speak the language. I couldn't do much. But soon after, I, uh, we went to school, uh, to several schools through the week. In the evening, we came home from work, we ate something, we ran to school. They had the night schools uh, for language uh, in several, this one on Monday, that one on Tuesday, and so on. We, we rapidly learned the language. Uh, we lived in Milbury 10 years, actually, and uh, then we moved uh, to Burlingame in 1962. We bought a house at uh, the end of uh, in, uh, 61, okay. and uh, it got ready by 62, and we moved on the 14th of May mm -hmm. in 1962. Our daughter was born in uh, 1958. In 1974, when she was in Mills High School, one teacher, uh, Miss Garrick was her name, she was teaching, and one time I got to talk to her about I came to talk like all parents do about their children, uh, and she was asking me when I mentioned that I was in the Holocaust and so on, 
she mentioned that she would like me to speak to a class that she had problems with. They were doping and they were suicidal, so she had many problems. And she said, maybe if they'll hear your story, they will realize that life is worth more than, than what they're going to make of themselves. And uh, I practically never stopped since then, all over. From there, uh, the one teacher told the other, Sunnyvale, uh, here, there. So until I was able to drive myself to the schools, I used my own car, my own time, my own gas, and I was the happiest person alive that I can do this. I can actually teach the Holocaust. At that time, there was no name even for it, and people weren't very anxious to hear about the, the Holocaust, you know. Yeah. It was any, any time I attempted to tell my story or part of it, people were just, they were not interested. And you know, actually, the way my opinion is that they started being interested in uh, listening to the Holocaust or what happened during that time in the world was when Schindler's List uh, movie came out. That's what brought up the right. interest. That's what they, that's what started showing how inhuman we were declared as uh, as uh, subhuman the Jews, and therefore we have no right to live. We were doomed to death. We were, we were uh, all to, to be murdered. We all have to die, no matter what babies, what they did. It's, it's, there was no precedent. The Jews, all through history, the Jews were always a scapegoat here and there in the world. Mm -hmm. But this was uh, something like this never happened before, and it was unimaginable. My father, speaking a little English, would listen to the, vo uh, the Voice of America when we were still in our own home in the early 40s. And the stories he was bringing up from since we had our own home and our own uh, basement, he was able to, uh, to listen to the Voice of America because you know that all the Jews had to serve in our radios. Not too many people had radios in those days because they were very expensive. But uh, uh, we did have, and they confiscated the radios. My younger brother had a little radio. He said he saved this money for years. He's not going to give it, and he's going to take a chance. And so my father was able to go down in the basement and listen to the Voice of America in English. Because although the Voice of America was constantly speaking in different languages, for the different people of the world or, or of, the, of Europe. But uh, in English, my, uh, we never heard the English word. And my father, he spent four years in, in America. He, his uh, language wasn't uh, so perfect. And when he brought these horrible stories, we could not believe. Could you believe that men, women, and children are being murdered by the, uh, by the hundreds, by the thousands, and, and mass graves are being found where they were drawing back because they were not doing very well in, in, in the countries that they, they had uh, broken into. So uh, mass graves were being found uh, of Jews, men, women, and children, we couldn't believe it. So we kept saying to our father, don't listen to the Voice of America. It's all American propaganda. It cannot be true. The world wouldn't allow this to happen. Yeah. We, it just couldn't uh, sink into our heads that, yes, the world did let it happen. America was heaven. Yes, my book mm -hmm. came out in 1995. Uh, as I was going from school to school through the years, I was often told by teachers and students that I should write my story because this was before every house had a, a computer. There were no computers in every house at that time. And uh, you, you're old, you're going to die, you must leave your story behind. So I started in Hungarian making myself notes as I was speaking. 
and I gathered up the material by the time my daughter was <laughs> was a, a teacher in uh, in uh, Cemetery High School. And the summer she said, okay, I have a computer, we'll write the book. So we did that during that summer, and the book came out in 1945, uh, 1995. And uh, I, in the beginning, I was giving, in every school that I was speaking, I put a few li in their libraries. And uh, the more, as the years went by, I'm in, in effect right now, my own only uh, copy is this that I have. Uh, I have given six years ago uh, my book over to Mills High, uh, to uh, Mercy High School. Mercy, uh, the Holocaust Center in San Francisco didn't exist for about two years or so. And uh, Mercy High School decided that they want to have open a Holocaust Center, and they did, and they call it, they call it the Helen and Joe Farkas Study Hall uh, to teach the Holocaust in Catholic schools, Mercy High School. The Helen and Joe Farkas Center for the Study of the Holocaust in Catholic schools. Now, since then, I have been speaking to all, probably all of the Catholic schools in, on the peninsula, across the bay, and uh, uh, many of them never had uh, a Holocaust survivor speak. Mm -hmm.